It's a great pleasure to welcome Clive Bramham to MIT. Uh, Clive is professor and head of neuroscience at the University of Bergen in Norway. And uh, I, was, I learned that Clive has spent most of his scientific career in Bergen. He went there for his MD and PhD. Uh, uh, and then after a short postdoc state side went back and uh, rose through the, the ranks very quickly and uh, is now the head of the department. Um, uh, Clive's work has had a huge influence on the field of synaptic plasticity. Uh, he, he, his, his work has contributed very significantly to an understanding of activity dependent molecules that regulate the function and structure of synapses. His early work was on BDNF as a trigger for transcription, but then for the last 20 plus years, uh, uh, Clive's lab has emerged as a leading lab studying the role of ARC as a master regulator, or the master organizer of synaptic plasticity, the function of the protein, its, its role as an effector more recently, uh, beautiful studies on the structural analysis of the ARC protein, and uh, many, many uh, seminal uh, studies describing how ARC can work to regulate the, the, the function and structure of synapses, and this led uh, uh, to a conversation between us and uh, 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 to many, many ideas that we have exchanged on the emerging role of ARC in understanding synapses and how they change. And of course, I remind you that ARC is a target of many genes of autism that have been linked to autism spectrum disorders. Most importantly, ARC is the target of FMRP and fragile X mental retardation protein is arguably one of the most important proteins that has been linked to at least the syndromic form of autism, but even to other forms of autism. Uh, 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 so understanding the fundamental biology of how synapses change via molecules that have been implicated in risk genes, implicated as targets of risk genes, is to my mind one of the most effective ways to get a mechanistic understanding of autism spectrum disorder, which is of course the mission of the Simon Center. So with that, we are delighted to welcome uh, Clive uh, for his seminar. Thank you very much, uh, Milagonka. It, uh, uh, for the kind introduction, it really is a great pleasure to be here. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, I'm now spending two months as a visiting scientist at, at Genelia Research Campus, and it's a lot of fun to wake up every morning and just be here. Um, yeah, so uh, my lab is uh, interested in understanding the molecular basis of information storage in the brain. And ARC has, a, has emerged as a, as a critical regulator. So um, our approach in large measure uh, today is a, is a single molecule approach. Um, and you'll th I think you'll, you'll get a sense for how this is, uh, how we're taking, how this, this is developing towards the development of new tools to understand memory formation also at the systems level. Um, so you'll be familiar with this sort of thinking, uh, the, the levels of organization uh, underlying control of behavior, information storage, a girl reading a book, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, and committing these lines to memory involving different regions of the brain, circuitry of the brain, down to the cellular level, the glia, and the neurons, um, the compartmentalization of signals along the dendrite, signaling and transmission at the synapse, regulation of ion channel activity, gene expression, and protein synthesis. And the latter two are uh, still today considered to be essential for long-term memory formation and for long-term forms of plasticity. So, um, Long-term potentiation and long-term depression to well-known um, acronyms. These represent generic, uh, these are generic terms for complex phenomena 
um, that are uh, mediated by a variety of different mechanisms um, in the brain. It's not one thing, and a single neuron does not necessarily have one type of LTP or one type of LT, uh, LTD. Um, we know that a major determinant of the strength of a glutamatergic synapse is the abundance of the postsynaptic amper receptors, and that for long-term changes, cytoskeletal modulation and de novo protein synthesis and gene expression are required at, at one stage or another. Normally, it's the earliest events in the process that have been studied. Um, so my lab, looking at a sort of textbook view of what happens to, what does a gene do, um, we have this linear view and with the, the DNA being processed and so forth and resulting in the expression of the protein. And we've worked at different levels here and our current focus is really at the level of protein activity control, protein biochemistry, how does it work? How does the ARC protein work? And so we've worked on uh, brain drug neurotrophic factor as a, uh, a trigger for synaptic plasticity, track B dependent signaling, regulation of dendritic protein synthesis, and now the focus um, on the ARC protein in recent years. And um, yeah, so this is a slide from 2010, and I think that it depicts um, up until, well, uh, last year, it depicts my, my view of uh, how the ARC system is working, uh, and that re what really characterizes it uh, is its dynamic nature. Uh, with the, uh, the POL2 poised at the transcription start site, very rapid gene expression, production of the pre-RNA in a matter of um, less than five minutes, the delivery of the RNA uh, into dendritic processes, and then both the RNA and the protein that's produced are rapidly degraded uh, in exacting the function of the protein. For instance, an LTP or an LTD, uh, in homeostatic scaling. And of course, ARC, uh, ARC gene is involved in memory, it's involved in postnatal cortical plasticity in the visual cortex, as shown by Mdegonka, Sue's lab, and other labs. So it's dynamic. A large fraction of the RNA uh, transports to dendrites, but not all. ARC is also synthesized in the cell body. So just to give you an idea of the, of the, the, the dynamic nature of the ARC protein, Here's a slide from, uh, from uh, our work from 2007. Um, live rat anesthetized, we're stimulating the medial perforant path input to the dentate gyrus. And arc antisense is being infused at two different time points, two hours or four hours after induction of LTP by high frequency stimulation of the perforant pathway. And you can see the exquisite time sensitivity of the response. Antisense delivered here results in a rapid reversion of the LTP. And this is then matched, if you do a time course, in, in the loss of the protein and, and, uh, by Western blood and mutohistochemistry to about 50%. So the protein is uh, rapidly translated. It acts quickly. It's rapidly acting. And it's degraded to participate critically in this process of LTP consolidation. OK. So what is the ARC protein and how does it work? Most of the talk will focus on that. And then the last uh, series of slides, about 10 minutes, will be on optical control um, of ARC function, new tools for that. Um, so the, the, the way that I see ARC protein's role in plasticity is that ARC is acting uh, as an adapter protein, as a hub protein to mediate protein-protein interactions in the cell. So here is a, a protein interactome um, and a list of partners that have been identified. And many of these have been identified through low throughput assays, such as yeast 2 hybrid, pull down, co-IP. So they have a good degree of reliability. And some really direct interactions have been shown by surface plasmon resonance and so forth. Um, but looking at, at this list, one can assemble a um, what can organize the, the output pathways into a, a scheme uh, in which we have a one channel uh, involved in regulation of actin cytoskeletal dynamics with wa wave one interaction, cofilin interaction involved in LTP. Um, we have ARC engaging proteins that are in, uh, mediate clathrin mediated endocytosis, 
internalization of glutamate AMPA receptors, for instance. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, that ARC is synthesized in the nucleus, and a lot of ARC ends up in the nucleus over a period of time. And novel roles for ARC are emerging in the nucleus and uh, nuclear binding partners, such as the, uh, the histone acetylase TIP60. OK. So um, we, want, we are interested in trying to understand this um, diversity of ARC function in meeting the different types of plasticity. Is there, is there a switch on ARC? That would be convenient. And then in terms of uh, mediating the understanding of the molecular control, it doesn't have to be on ARC. But it could be, for instance, a protein-protein uh, interaction, regulation of the interaction by po a post-translational modification. Um, but uh, in approaching those issues, it's a bit um, dissatisfying because we're still left with the question, what is the ARC protein itself? And really nothing was written about it. Um, uh, this is what we knew from 2010. So we had basically a, a stick diagram and that it had a, a potential binding sites for endophilin and dynamin 2. Um, it, and it was not a transcription factor, has no known DNA or RNA binding motifs. It's not an enzyme or calcium binding motifs. And this fits in with the really current view of, of ARC as a, as a hub protein that works by engaging different effector proteins. Now to try to get at the biochemical nature of the ARC protein itself, we first teamed up with a Professor Aurora Martinez in Bergen. And the PhD student in my lab, Craig Myram, he managed to purify large amounts of ARC for the first time and then carry out, carry out a series of um, protein biochemical, physical chemical analyses. And he was able to show that the ARC protein has two major domains, an N-terminal domain and a C-terminal domain that have, that have opposite charges and fundamentally different properties, and that the ARC protein undergoes a reversible oligomerization. So with, biochemical with a biochemical technique called dynamic light scattering, he was able to show the assembly into large oligomers temp in a temperature-dependent way, which could be lowered down, and then you could actually rescan and do a re-oligomerization of the protein. So um, it has two domains, uh, a highly basic N-terminal domain and a highly acidic C-terminal domain. Um, they have different thermal properties, and I really, it was not important really to go into that right now. And um, by dynamic light -like scattering, he was able to show um, that uh, the reversible oligomerization of the protein. So we can get very large structures, and then when the temperature is lowered, one can actually redo these scans. Um, in, the, in the aqueous water state, in, uh, pure, in pure water, ARC uh, can be expressed uh, as a monomer. So this small peak here has a hydrodynamic diameter of 5.7 nanometer, which corresponds to 48 kilodalton monomer. This may be an extended monomer or possibly a dimer, but we only see that in water. So under salt conditions, the protein tends to form um, oligomers. Um, we also took the bacterially, ex the bacterially expressed recombinant protein and imaged it by electromicroscopy and by atomic for force microscopy. Um, and so in, our, in this first analysis, we we're really sort of harping on being able to show that we have a monomeric form of arc, right? Uh, so the one aspect was that the formation of aggregates, that's a problem and you know, may, may not be physiological. So you want to be able to show that we could see the orderly oligomerization, not just massive aggregation, and that we could see uh, the monomers. Well, the monomers were too, too small to really discern um, by EM. But with salt, that we did see these, the, these aggregates beginning to form. And in this buffer here, Hepi's buffer with salt, we saw uh, on average about 30 nanometer diameter, diameter particles, which looked uh, to the, at least to the innocent observer or non-trained observer like a, 
uh, amorphous aggregates, no really regular structure, but a pretty even diameter. Then when we did atomic force microscopy, um, we were able to see the shape, of, the shape of some of these structures. And it turns out now that these structures uh, may be akin, we may be looking at the, these, the virus particles which were discovered by Jason Shepard's lab and Vivian Budnick's lab last year. And I'll return to that in, in, a, in a moment. But we knew nothing about that when we first took these images. Okay, so um, there is now uh, solid structural evidence that the, the ARC protein um, has, uh, has ancient retroviral origins. Um, it has uh, domains similar to that of the retroviral GAG polyprotein. So this is a paper all the way back from 2006. And when we started looking at ARC structure, I had seen, seen this. Um, I don't think I understood it really completely at the time. We didn't do anything about it. Um, we were rather thinking of that the C-terminal domain had the spectrum homology domain. And we knew that ARC was involved in regulating cytoskeletal dynamics. So we made a homology model based on, on the spectrum repeats, rather. But if you look at this, it's interesting. You have the, GAG, the retroviral GAG protein up here, and it has, many, it has the virus as many other pieces to it. And then there are a family of proteins that are related to GAG, and these are domesticated forms um, uh, expressed in, in, um, in mammals, uh, and that have evolved then domest as domestications domestications from the gypsy TIE 3 retrotransposon. Okay, um, then in 2015, Paul Worley published this beautiful data on the first crystal structure of the ARC C terminal domain. And he did this by using TARP gamma 2 stargazing for co-crystallization. So it actually wasn't done as a complete low, but in two pieces. We don't know what the complete piece looks, looks like yet. But uh, this, this structure is beautifully homologous to that of the capsid domain of the retroviral gag. Um, in addition, he found something unusual that is certainly not there in the virus, and that is that the end lobe has a hydrophobic binding pocket to which a number of protein partners will go inside and dock, stargazing being one of them. So it contains um, a very interesting signaling mo uh, module, uh, if you will, as well. Okay, so uh, they had the crystal structure of this piece. We were trying to get the entire crystal structure, and that's an ongoing activity, I'm sure, in several labs. But we decided to step back a bit and see if we could use a small angle X-ray scattering to get the, uh, the full structure of ARC. And uh, we were able to do this, and the trick really was in solubilizing ARC for long enough to be able to do the experiment, because it does tend to form these uh, ligamers or aggregates at high enough concentration. And that was done by raising the pH to pH 11. Then we were able to, to obtain by, um, you can see this, these images from size exclusion chromatography, gel chromatography, with multi-angle light scattering, we could detect then a monomeric peak, and we could lower the pH now back down to a neutral pH and still have a monomeric peak. And we actually know that this difference in solubilization is due to um, the highly basic nature of the, uh, of the N-terminal domain. Um, okay, so this is a recombinant protein, and now this is a material from the rat brain, a lysate from the rat brain. Um, just blot with an ARC antibody, so this is the right molecular weight for ARC in the rat, it's expressed in the, in the brain, native ARC. And uh, so at pH 7, you get just a little bit. At pH 12, um, you now are solubilized ARC, and you have a large signal that's just as strong as what you get when you use SDS. So at that point, uh, we are ready to shoot this, uh, shoot this in. Uh, and perform the, the uh, SACS measurements, and I won't go into any sort of detail on this, but you can see these are the pieces of the ARC protein that were, that were used, different segments of the ARC protein, and then you, one obtains the, the scattering profiles here, the modeling is done based on the raw data in various ways uh, to come up with uh, structural information. 
Uh, so we also did synchrotron radiation CD analysis as well as, as homology modeling. And that gave us a full length arc structure um, in which we have uh, the C terminal domain. This is from the Worley lab here, these two pieces, the N lobe here and the C lobe. And then on the N terminal domain, we have an elongated um, anti parallel coil, a coil coil arrangement. Um, and then between them, a flexible linker region. And I forgot to mention that arc protein has a lot of disorder. And this linker region is mostly disordered. But what we see when we express the protein and do SACs is that uh, it stay, the two regions, uh, the, the uh, positive and negative regions, uh, come together. And that stabilizes this flexible linker. So there's now literal, little mobility in it. Um, we also looked at binding uh, of different peptides, uh, stargazin, GCAP, uh, and several others, to this end lobe, thinking that that might produce a conformational change which we could then work with and understand how the protein is working. But we didn't see any, anything uh, to write home about, nothing really pronounced. Okay. Um, so uh, we also took the, and expressed these same fragments in hippocampal neurons and did um, ratiometric FRET imaging and fluorescence lifetime imaging. So in, uh, in my lab, we did the ratiometric FRET imaging with single cell electroporation of uh, uh, hippocampal pyramidal cells and dentate granule cells. And then in collaboration with Yasunori Hayashi, we did the, the FLIM analysis, and this time using a gene gun. Um, and we got, very, so course, we got very matching and supporting results for the, of, of the structural data. And just to give you an idea, so this is, here are these pieces that we looked at. So this 1 to 140 amino acid piece, it's drawn here based on the structure. So it's going from that, the, the, uh, the start of the protein, the end terminal to the uh, beginning of the linker region. And so you can see by the FLIM analysis here, that we get a very strong FRET signal from that piece. It's actually much stronger than what you get from the full length protein. So there was concordance there, which was nice. Um, so Eric Halin, the postdoc in, in the Petri Kursilis lab who did this, um, the, the biochemical work, he also looked at the distribution uh, of the ARC protein in liposomes um, and to try to find out which region of ARC mediates association with uh, phospholipid membranes and found that it was this highly basic uh, end terminal domain um, that's uh, required to mediate the, the, the pelleting of ARC uh, within the, the lipid fraction. And that interaction could be blocked out by adding phosphate groups um, consistent with, and he has other data as well in the paper, that, that ARC is, that the binding um, of ARC is mediated by the end terminal domain through, by, uh, through interactions with these charged head groups of the phospholipids. Okay, and that would give a model something like this, where you'd have a membrane binding of protein, allowing it to interact with uh, membrane inserted proteins such as stargazin. Um, so, so from th that work, we have uh, several basic conclusions that, that ARC uh, uh, expressed as a monomer, uh, has, a, has a closed structure, the internal domain is mediating the membrane binding, the internal domain appears to be important for, for the oligomerization because um, it's the, the high pH was able to neutralize the charge in the internal domain to allow solubilization. If we cut that out and move it away and just work with these C terminal regions, they're all monomers. So SACS gives just single profiles for all of the, all of the other structures. Um, and the internal domain is probably an, an elongated anti-parallel coil coil. Okay, so January last year, uh, two seminal papers appeared in Cell, one from Jason Shepard's lab at the University of Utah, and one from Vivian Budnick and um, Travis Thompson at UMass Worcester. One in the, in the mammalian, one in mammalian neurons at, and the other at the, at the fly larvae neuromuscular junction. And uh, yeah, the, these uh, studies sort of both got started with the observation of 
viral capsid-like structures. So here is a, a, an EM image, um, a negative stain EM of HIV gag particles from 1999. And when um, Jason's lab purified the rat protein uh, using a phosphate buffer, which we didn't use at that time or in our earlier study, they saw these beautiful particles that suggested to them uh, that ARC is forming a virus-like structure, a virus-like capsid. And the same thing um, in the fly, that you get very, very similar structure. There's just a low mag and high mag. In the case of Vivian Budnick, they were also able to, uh, to lyse the extracellular vesicles that contain these capsids and the immunostain and then show the, the endogenous um, capsids inside the vesicles. And so um, these studies suggest that, that ARC no, not only has biochemical features, a, bio, a domain that looks like the ARC protein, but it, actually is, is, it is actually acting um, like a, an endogenous neuronal uh, virus um, in the sense that it's able to capture RNA uh, inside the, the capsid. And that capsid then is enveloped and released in an extracellular vesicle. And uh, there is evidence from both of these papers that the RNA can be transmitted to neighboring cells. Okay. Um, and so, uh, so with that discovery, uh, we now have a rather puzzling picture. We have ARC on the one hand as a master regulator of plasticity by engaging various proteins inside the neuron. On the other hand, it's um, undergoing a oligomerization to form these virus-like capsids that are able to transmit RNA and fundamentally then would represent a new form of, uh, of uh, interneuronal communication by RNA transfer in extracellular vesicles, which is, which is ARC specific. Um, and so what we wanted to do then, uh, we, where we were working on this, because we were trying to understand the oligomerization, um, and then Maria Erickson got her PhD on this uh, last fall. Uh, we wanted to try to identify the regions of the ARC protein that are mediating oligomerization, including the high order oligomerization uh, and the capsid formation. And so um, the first approach that she did um, was a biochemical, purely biochemical one, in which she um, uses a stringent strep2 affinity purification of ARC protein expressed in strep cells. So we have uh, one construct in which we have a GFP arc, M turquoise 2 arc, N terminally fused, and then we have a C terminally fused strip 2 tagged arc. They're both expressed in the hex cells. The purification is done, and then um, uh, the lysate is immunoblotted for the, the detection of arc, for a detection of an arc arc uh, interaction. So that was uh, mapped out in different ways. In different ways, we um, cut the protein into these respective regions, N-terminal domain, linker, C-terminal domain, and so forth. And um, she was able to show that the, uh, that the second coil of this anti-parallel coil coil is necessary and required uh, for the oligomerization. That's what her data was suggesting. Um, yeah, she also, there are several cysteines in ARC which could result in and artifactual ligamerization when the protein is overexpressed. But we, had, we saw no effect. We still saw a ligamerization when these cysteines, these five cysteines were mutated. OK. So just to show you, give you an idea, uh, uh, some more of the same, um, where she was uh, mapping out the, the role of this N-terminal domain. And you can see when she uses the 1 to 140 region, she sees the, the, the arc interaction. So she looked at interaction between, the, between fragments of arc with a full length arc and did this in various ways to um, hopefully convincingly show that there's a real interaction. Um, and then she hammered, she sort of tunneled in on, on this end terminal um, domain, the second coil. To, uh, to isolate the region within the second coil that's involved. So she first did a deletional analysis, I think it's of 14 amino acids. 
Um, and, uh, and along with that, then, a 70 amino acid alanine scanning. So she started from the beginning of the coil and then just scanned her way down um, 70 amino acids at a time to identify the most important regions. And um, I'll show some of the data from this in, in a second. But basically, the conclusion is that in the central portion uh, of the second coil, there's an approximately 33 amino acid uh, peptide, which we're calling the oligomerization domain. And inside of that, there's a 70 amino acid motif. This motif that we, happened to, that we, that we found was the most critical for the formation uh, of oligomers mediated by the full length uh, ART protein. And that is from region 113 to 119. These are alanine mutations. Um, so the affinity purification indeed shows that with the, the alanine mutation in 113 to 119, there's now no signal. If we mutate uh, further and, and terminally, still within the second coil, um, we do see the, the oligomerization. Um, as a complementary approach, we use the peptide scanning array. We have GST arc uh, of the second coil, um, and then applied that to, um, uh, to, vary, to these peptides. And again, you can see that, that the binding within this region that corresponds to uh, the approximately 33 amino acid oligomerization domain. Um, we also looked at we also looked at this a, a bit uh, in um, hippocampal slight cultures again using FLIMFRET imaging, um, where you can see that there's strong uh, initial FRET from the positive control, the GFP M cherry fused, and actually the the second coil um, shows an equally strong um, FLIM signal that upon mutation of this 70 amino acid motif is significantly reduced, offset. But it doesn't reach the level of the, uh, of the separated proteins as a control. So it suggested that there is still some in arc arc interaction um, with this mutation that's present in the live cell. OK, so uh, looking at this oligomerization domain, um, this is an amphipathic peptide. Uh, so this cartoon arrangement just shows the position of the residues looking down the length of the coil. And you can see that the hydrophil hydrophilic residues are really clustering on, on, the, on one side and the hydrophobic on the other. And it's quite also quite interesting that um, the, this peptide is pH neutral, whereas overall the, the domain is highly basic, which means there must be many basic residues um, and the chart, we can show that in the diagram as well. There are many um, basic residues within the N-terminal domain just flanking this critical region for oligomerization. Okay. Um, and so one of the questions is, how is the, um, how is the, the capsid assembly, how might that uh, be taking place? Um, and so it's certainly of interest to look again at uh, what is known about these processes uh, in the retroviruses. And there are various pathways that are described. It's not the same for the, for the individual members of the retroviridae family. Um, but um, it's known that the, uh, at the, on the N-terminal side, the matrix region um, of the virus plays an important role in membrane targeting uh, of the gag protein. Um, which is the place where the immature virion assembles. And um, that involves the palmitoid, that involves the misdorylation of the matrix domain, as well as binding to transfer RNA. So we became interested in the possible role of, of, of RNA in mediating uh, the capsid formation. So, um, so GAG is a cartoon structure of a GAG, one has the matrix domain, the capsid, uh, which, are, which, is the, which are the domains that actually mediate the, the dimerization and the assembly of, of the capsid lattice. Matrix being involved in the membrane binding. Uh, binding of transfer RNA is associated with chaperoning uh, the GAG protein to the highly acidic 
uh, inner leaf of the plasma membrane and, and effectively competing out binding to uh, intracellular membranes along the way. So it's in getting gag to the membrane. Now, there's an, also a nucleocapsid domain, which uh, there's no sign of that uh, in the ARC protein that binds the viral genomic RNA, but it also binds non-specifically uh, to host RNA, and that's important for mediating gag-gag interactions and the assembly of the capsid at the membrane. So a little bit of viral background there that was of interest to us as we started to try to understand how ARC is working. So ARC has a predicted uh, matrix region here in the N-terminal domain. Um, so we decided to look at the, the assembly of the capsids. Um, at first, we wanted to go back and see what is the size uh, of the oligomers um, inside cells, and to take a second look at that. And we did that by in situ cross-linking, taking the live hex cells and treating them then with uh, the cross-linking agent, DSG. And what we found was that the, that the ARC monomer is present, but we also get a strong dimer signal in the wild type, in this uh, oligomerization mutant, um, and in a control mutation, too, of an endothelin binding site. So we get equal expression of a dimer. Um, but formation above there appears to be attenuated. So this is these statistics where we compare the trimer level to the dimer level is reduced then in this second coil mutant. So to, to really quantify the changes in the ligomeric state, we teamed up with a Meg Stratton at UMass Amherst and uh, performed single molecule photobleaching turf microscopy. Um, in this case too, we're expressing recombinant protein this is then affixed to glass cover slips. There's a peg surface, um, and the ARC protein has a snap tag on the N terminus and the AV tag on the C terminus. And the AV tag allows biotinylation and then binding um, to the peg. Um, and then what's, what's done then is fluorescence imaging uh, of these spots on the glass cover slip. Um, and so fluorescence photobleaching over time will lead then to a step loss of fluorescence in the individual puncta that can be quantified uh, to estimate the number of arc molecules resident in each puncta. So you start off like, looking like this. You have uh, puncta, green puncta, various sizes. And then in the last frame, you have blackness. And what you can do is look at, at, the, at the step transitions in fluorescence as the bleaching takes place. And that will then uh, give you the number of arc molecules. And certainly, this is very accurate in terms of up to about 10 uh, arc molecules or so. And um, what Meg and, um, was able to show, Rory O'Connell is a bachelor's degree student there, and James Chambers is at the imaging facility. Um, they were able to show that the second coil motif is, plays a critical role in the formation of large oligomers between, containing between 30 and 170 arc molecules. Um, and that the addition of exogenous RNA, this is EGFP RNA, which is added to the purified protein, um, promotes the formation dramatically of these, of these large structures. So if you look here, we have so in the wild type arc protein, full length, we have a certain number of monomers, and this is dramatically then increased by the addition of the GFP RNA. Um, in the case of the mutant, there are n none of these large oligomeric structures. Um, also at the low oligomer level, you can see that when the addition of GFP RNA, there's a transition from a dimer to a, a tetra, and on average, a tetrameric state, and that does not occur in this mutation. So it appears then that this motif in the purified protein, there's no membrane, there are no other factors involved, no cellular factors involved. That this motif um, is required for the response to, to the exogenous RNA in mediating the high order oligomerization. Um, so in parallel, in this work, we're collaborating with Jose Maria Valpuesta, 
um, the same lab as before, going back to this issue of electromicroscopy of the recombinant protein. So here is the same Im image I showed you before that was done in HEPI's buffer. When we now use phosphate buffer, um, we're able to see the capsid structures. Other oligomeric forms as well, but clearly you can see the, the rounded capsid structures. And with GFP RNA, we don't see, we see mainly an improvement on what they look like. So they're more rounded, in, more rounded in shape, more regular in their shape. And again, the diameter is approximately 30 nanometers, as we saw before. So similar to here. And then we also performed a gel filtration analysis on this, and we were able to obtain a better purification. Well, perhaps this is mainly a replication of what uh, the Shepherd lab showed. Um, we then took the gel filtrated fraction and performed multi-angle light scattering um, to estimate the mass. And what we find is that the, uh, the result is that we get a, a mass of 38 ART proteins um, within these, the so-called capsid fraction, so 1.7 megadaltons. But the mutant um, has n shows no sign of forming high order, high order oligomers in this preparation. Um, and SecMouse indicates in a molecular weight of 160 kilodaltons, indicating a dimer. Uh, Sachs analysis uh, shows a similar result, as does dynamic light scattering. So uh, Jose Mar Maria's lab has gone on to look to do a 3D reconstruction based on some 55,000 particles, and this is the un well, this is the 3D reconstruction uh, raw, if you will. This is with imposed C2 symmetry. And then you can see that within this size of the structure, the docking of two arc molecules uh, fits very nicely. And, and, and uh, the most, consist the most uh, likely model that we're in the process of testing, that is that in the dimer, it's the NTD and the CTD that, that dock and, and, and interact. Because we, we know that the C-terminal domains themselves are not directly interacting. Okay, so um, we have uh, the, the field is at a crossroads, um, and I think it's a very interesting time. So ARC is a protein that is implicated in higher cognitive processes. It appears to have evolved to, to, be, listen, to be induced on demand to mediate uh, plastic changes in neural circuits. Um, so on the one hand, it is a master regulator of protein-protein interactions, um, contributing to underlying various forms of plasticity. On the other hand, uh, it appears to be able to assemble into these larger structures. And as I mentioned, there is evidence, for, at least from the fly, of the endogenous art protein having, uh, making a capsid. Um, so what we don't know is, well, there are many questions. Is the art capsid um, assembling in response to a stimulus? What is the relationship between the plasticity arc and the capsid arc? What is the nature of the cargo and the carrying capacity of, of, uh, of such a, a capsid? And what are the, in the, uh, the targets? And can, these been can these be demonstrated in intact tissue in the intact brain? So these are really exciting times ahead. Um, and I wanted to mention just briefly a couple of points. I think it's a, just, just to get the framework of this, is that uh, there also, there's also a lot of work going on to try to identify post-translational modifications of the ARC protein that are involved. And some of you may be wondering about that. So we know, for instance, that, that uh, ARC is phosphorylated right here on serine 206. That's involved in regulating the nucleocytoplasmic uh, expression of ARC, it may have a, a synaptic role as well. Um, ARC is sumorylated, and that's associated with, with targeting of ARC to the cytoskeleton, and we know that ARC has a role in regulation of the cytoskeletal activity. The turnover of ARC you, by, by ubiquitin, by lysine acetylization of ARC, and this internal domain also is palmitoylated, and that's implicated in membrane anchoring. Okay. Then I know that uh, a lot of people are, interest, are working in, um, in clinically or in uh, translational work. Uh, we don't have time to go into any of the details there, but there's a, you know, a huge chapter here that's, that's being explored. It's very interesting. 
um, which really is imp implicating the, uh, the arc complex. So you have the arc protein and the focus on that, but there's the interaction complex around it is very large and complex. And how that's being regulated in the context of schizophrenia and ASD and so forth um, is, a, is, a, is a hot topic. And we know that uh, a number of the, uh, the so-called schizophrenia-associated proteins do dock inside of this N-lobe binding pocket. Okay. So um, in, my, in the last few minutes, I'd like to say a few words about our progress so far on trying to put the ARC protein um, under optical control. As you'll see, it's actually not the ARC protein, it's the ARC N-lobe. Um, but in trying to do this biochemistry uh, and figure out the switch between LTP and LTD um, and, and find the structure, we'd, we'd, on, we'd like to do really two things. One is to develop biosensors that we can use to, to image the use of this high level, of these high level forms of plasticity. So not NMD receptor dependent induction, uh, not CREP activation, but, but activity at the synapse and in the nucleus to really to be able to explain how the different types of, of arc mediated plasticity are being utilized uh, in the brain. Um, and the second one is to try to put arc under optical control. So um, that has been the project of uh, postdoc Hong Yu Zhang. Um, she'll be joining me at Genelia in a couple of weeks. And uh, so she has, been, she, she has been looking at the surface mobility of AMPA receptors and has now evidence that ARC is regulating the surface mobility of AMPA receptors uh, by the end lobe interaction with stargazin, um, which uh, she proposed is competing out then the binding of stargazin to PSD95 in the postsynaptic density. So you, I think you may be familiar from the work of Daniel Choquet and others of the, uh, the different pools of ARC, the lateral diffusion of ARC, the diffusional trapping at, at the postsynaptic membrane face, um, endocytosis, and so forth. So the relationship between these different pools is not totally clear. Um, and so she thinks that, that ARC could play a role uh, in regulating the diffusional trapping of ARC by, by competing with stargazin binding. Um, and to, to look at this, she's been using single particle quantum dot tracking. Um, and I won't show the movie, but these red pots, these red dots are the, are, the, are the quantum dots and you can see them moving around and in, in a very nice way. We won't spend time looking at that movie. Um, and so what she did first was she, she took a primary hippocampal neuronal culture and she, she expressed either the, the, uh, the full-length arc or the wild-type N-lobe protein. And for both of these, she found an increase uh, in surface mobility of the AMPA receptors. Then uh, she also took the cultures and knocked down arc by SHRNA and sees then a, a, a reduction uh, in the surface mobility. Okay, that's from an untreated culture. Um, then she made um, mutations uh, within the, the, the arc end lobe and saw, and the mutations that she picked were two of the sites that were shown to regulate the docking by Worley's lab, the docking of stargazin uh, into the end lobe binding pocket, one in the beta sheet groove and one deep inside the pocket itself. Um, and they're sort of in red squares here. And you can see that both of these are reducing um, the amount of uh, surface mobility relative to expression, the expression of the M cherry fused uh, arc end lobe wild type. Okay, then to, uh, to try to put the arc under optical control, um, we teamed up with uh, Michael Lin at Stanford. Um, we had been discussing doing this with Michael uh, since 2012, but we, but we really didn't know what to do. Um, and then when Paul Worley published the crystal structure and showed that there was this binding pocket, we thought, huh, maybe that would work. And so what, what we did was that we tethered uh, this, this drompa that, that Michael has made. So it's tetrameric, but he made a dimeric form that can open and close and engineered this that, to get the properties just right. So with, with 500 nanometer light, it would, it would open and it can be reversibly, it's reversibly photoswitchable so it can go back and you can do this over and over again. Um, 
And so what we did is we tethered these domains of Drampa on either side of the end lobe. Uh, and that's the cartoon of it, but this is the actual structural data um, from what it looks like. Um, so this is the, the wild type Drampa that does not have this property of uh, coming together. Um, so it's expressed, so when you express it, it's in, a, in the open state like this. And then with this mutant that you can actually open with light, but when you just don't give light, it's closed, um, you get these sac structures that give uh, yeah, those results. And so if you express then the wild type Drampa, this one, you get increased surface mobility. If you just express this, you don't see a significant change. Okay, and then finally, she uh, took the arc end lobe and expressed this in hippocampal neurons and showed that with 500 nanometer, nanometer light exposure, um, 491, she was able to see uh, a, a, a sharp and very rapid, within 10 minutes, increase in the surface mobility um, of, amper, of amper receptors, either GLUA2 or GLUA1. And this is just an, an example of some of the trajectories that she's seen. Okay, now she's working further to really pin down that it's actually stargazing mediating that, and she does have uh, evidence on that aspect as well. Um, so I'd like to conclude then with uh, just a few remarks about uh, where we stand to try to summarize. That uh, arc, is a, arc protein is a, is a loosey-goosey structure, uh, uh, the tertiary structure by... by um, Biophysical analyses is very loose and floppy in nature. But when, you express the, 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 when you express a single protein, though, in a monodispersed solution, it closes. Uh, what we don't know is actually how it's behaving inside the cell. When it binds to membrane, is it then opening? We don't know. Um, it has multiple ligand binding sites, so the end lobe can bind different proteins, but there are other binding sites as well, presnilin 1, for instance, dynamin 2, and so forth. So uh, ARC is a signaling hub molecule, and a part of what uh, I've spoken of today is that the monomeric ARC end lobe um, it regulates the surface mobility of AMPA receptors, and most likely that is by uh, interfering with the stargazing interaction with PSD95. Um, so the higher order ARC oligomerization and capsid formation is controlled by this N-terminal coil, coil motif in an RNA resp responsive manner. This has show so far been shown by the exogenous RNA, but I think that's really, really important to pin down the mechanism um, that is involved in the absence of cellular factors. In the internal domain, it has properties similar to both the gag matrix and the nucleocapsid domain. So the, the, the NTD is, so, is uh, responsible for the membrane binding. It also uh, has a, a, a palmitorylation link, so that's similar to the retrovirus. And then this nucleocapsid domain, which ARC does not have, um, it doesn't have it, but yet this response to the RNA is very similar to what you see uh, with the retrovirus, with the RNA forming a bridge between ARC molecules, allowing the oligomerization to, uh, to occur, to promote it. So we have this uh, fascinating dichotomy at the moment between ARC as a hub and the capsid. At the systems level, we really know in the mammalian brain, we know nothing. Um, so it's, I, I think it's, it will be exciting times ahead. And I like to think that it will be possible to develop um, new tools uh, for switching arc activity state, for uh, imaging the, the functional state of the arc protein uh, rationally, and, and possibly also for the development of, of arc capsids or arc protein as vehicles for RNA delivery. Um, so I uh, again like to, to thank uh, all of my collaborators um, and people in the lab. I thank many of them on the way, Aurora Martinez, Petri Kursla, um, in particular, Jose Maria Valpuesta in Spain, Meg Stratton in Amherst, um, Yasunori Hayashi in Kyoto, Michael Lin. And uh, thanks to the people who funded the work and thanks for your attention.
Yes. So what we're, what, we're, what we're focusing, what we'd like to do now, which is, I think, really necessary to make a satisfying, get a satisfying understanding, is to, to do the electrophysiology, to look at the changes in synaptic strength themselves. So we're doing that in, a, in, a, in acute slice preparations with photoactivation uh, yeah, of virally expressed arc end lobe to see, are we getting LTP? Are we getting LTD? What is the effect on synaptic transmission? And, hmm, yeah. So another part of the discussion, the very beginning was showing like toxic and negative LTP uh, consolidation in the slice and end lobe. Hmm. What is the toxic and negative LTP? Yeah, so, so the, the data from that paper shows that, that uh, arc synthesis is necessary for stabilization of nascent F-actin uh, in, the, in the region of activated synapses. And other papers have shown that there's, there's spine enlargement that's, that's F-actin dependent, also in the dentate gyres in vivo. Um, I think that these studies to go together very nicely. So, I mean, the, the sort of evidence that we had is that we, we uh, induced LTP and then we locally in, infused um, uh, uh, jasplaquinolide, uh, which had no effect by itself, but it completely blocked the, the effect of arc antisense delivery, and it blocked the ability to reduce the the uh, of uh, of uh, uh, yeah, it blocked the effect of the arc antisense. So, um, and now we know that uh, in the dentate gyrus in vivo, that arc is sumoylated and associates with the the uh, effect and binding protein, protein drebrin A. Um, Drebrin A it regulates the stability of the, of, the, of the actin core and the center of the spine, so it's a really critical me, a regulator of the um, long-term maintenance of the spine. Uh, in, in cortical neuronal cultures, um, uh, it's been shown that uh, with chemical LTP that, that, that Drebrin A um, will cut off uh, segments of F-actin filaments that's actually uh, is transported out of the spine and, and back in. So we think that, uh, uh, that the ARCS mechanism in LTP consolidation is related to that. But uh, the short answer is we don't know. F-actin regulation, yes. Uh, Drebrid is an interesting candidate. We don't know. Wave 1 also bi binds inside uh, this, this pocket. Um, so we're also looking, we're looking at that. We have their ongoing studies are looking at the role of, uh, of ARC in connection with Drebrin function. Um, yeah, uh, so, uh, so in mammalian, in mammalian brain, uh, what role it really depends on the nature of the cargo. Um, the only cargo that seems to be clear at present is ARC RNA itself. Um, I, what, I mean, I think that uh, based on the, on the viruses and based on this response to the GFP RNA, um, that uh, it's likely that, that the ARC is in capturing RNA in, in a nonspecific way. It's not through specific um, um, cis-acting motifs, you know, cis-trans interactions that are taking place. Uh, so it depends on what, whatever, what RNA is there. So we know quite a bit about the, the classes of RNA that are induced in, in response to LTP, for instance. Right? So, uh, so it will depend on where the capsids are, are, for, are they forming in dendrites? Are we getting a lot of dendritic RNAs? And you know, if, if that was the case, then it's likely that um, there would, th those are, that cargo would have any purpose in glia. Uh, so a lot of the work on, on extracellular vesicle uh, function um, has, uh, has really shown neuron glia interactions, Schwann cells and the microglia and so forth. And really there's not there's a large body of work on neuron to neuron uh, effects uh, mediated by extracellular vesicles. Um, the carrying capacity of the, of the capsid could be really ti quite tiny, uh, 10 kilobases. So there's, there's not much room for um, Mess, a lot of messen different messenger RNAs. More microRNAs you could, you could fit into there. 
Yeah. But yeah, I think uh, we don't really know yet. So I think it's also uh, uh, difficult to um, difficult to really see that if, you, if it was a, mess a dendritic messenger RNA cargo, how that would be impacting, let's say, a grid cell uh, in layer two of the entorhinal cortex. You'd have to have a long retrograde transport and have to be released, and then how would you be using the RNAs? That would be pretty funky if something like that existed. So it could go to a, could go to a neighboring dendrite, either on the, actually on the donor neuron is feeding back on itself, or to a lateral, a lateral neuron. Um, these are both interesting possibilities. But as I say, it depends on the class of the RNA. It, it fundamentally, unexpected, unusual things could be happening. Um, I have not attempted that, <laughs> but that's a, uh, it's a good question. We should, we, should, we should need to do that. What, what, I, what I do think is remarkable is that why has no one seen these before? And that's what people say too. Um, you know, a lot of electron microscopy is, has been done, and uh, you can see them on the, under the electron microscope. So where are they? Um, if they play such a major role, uh, do you, wouldn't you seed them if they're at spines or in the dendrites? Um, so you would think they'd be pretty obvious, but they they said the same thing about axonal axonal ribosomes, and uh, and now there's you know more and more evidence showing that ribosomes can be found uh, in terminals of adult mammalian axons. So uh, we'll we'll see. You know, I'm really not certain. Certainly possible. Yeah. Certainly possible. It's a good idea. But I think that with these questions, we are getting a bit, a bit ahead of ourselves since we, <laughs> since we, <laughs> we don't see the capsid. It, it is fun to speculate, indeed. Um, and also in, 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 in the connection with Alzheimer's disease and, uh, and the spread of tauopathy and so forth. Right? So that's pretty obvious if you have your know, arc is, a, is able to. to transmit signals between neurons in that way that uh, it could play, it might be involved in, in such propagation through neural networks. So I think, you know, it would be interesting to see what happens next. It's really important to identify that cargo, um, but it has, we have to know the cargo inside the, the arc capsid itself. So one can purify EV preparations, that's no problem, and do RNA-seq, but to actually identify the cargo that's inside arc will be important. But I think that the low carrying capacity in itself is not, is not a problem. It's actually common to all of these really small uh, micro vesicles. This is in the, in the lower order, but the 50 nanometers and lower, there are many you know, EVs that are in that, uh, of that, in that size range. Um, and so that you could have a shotgun approach. So each capsid will be containing um, a different portion, just a few copies, uh, it, but would have a shotgun approach and could convey a strong signal in that way. When you say the, the capsids have not been seen, where would you look? Because people have looked inside neurons, and the capsids, as I understand it, would fuse and release it. Yeah. I love it, yeah. No, I, 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 I love, the, love the question. I think it's logical, very logical in mammalian brain to look inside the neuron um, because you see, such a, you see very large increases of, of arc expression. Also very physiologically, you know, I mean, with, with a light, a light stimulus, you do. I, I mean, not in, in the entire population, uh, not this really strong signal that you would get, obviously, with afferent stimulation, but um, behaviorally. Uh, so I think that it would make sense that they're synthesizing the neurons, so why aren't they present? But it, I, don't, I don't know. Many, there have been umpteen EM studies, 3D reconstruction on LTP. Why hasn't Kristen Harris seen these structures? Uh, but in terms of the, of the EV preparation, so um, yeah, so I'm not sure if I have it here, but we do have, we have done an EV purification. And uh, we don't have any good data by uh, immuno-EM. 
But we do see a few of these extra vesicles have capsid-like structures. I'm not sure if all this might be there. Take a quick look. Yeah. Yeah, so this is from this is from a hippocampal neuron preparation. We purified the extracellular vesicles, and then you can see some internal structures there that in terms of their size and they they're consistent with it. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> Level of activity under which the, these retroviral capsids may be released. So, your experiments showing translocation of AMPA receptors via the stargazing interaction, or our experiments showing that ART can translocate from, from activated synapses into inactive synapses, there are under physiological levels of activity, as I would call it. But if you have very high levels of activity, you might have a di different mode of regulating ARC or perhaps even, uh, you know, telegraphing ARC. And so could you comment on the levels of activity that in now, in your experiments in which you're, you're examining the ARC capsid may be, be produced? Or is this something that you think Um, I, th I think that the, the, the work from the Budnick and uh, Thompson labs in their fly is the most physiological so far because they, they looked at developmental plasticity and then a more mature form of Hebbian plasticity and are showing functionally a role for uh, ARC in the, in the neuromuscular, uh, in the muscle uh, in those types of plasticity that is dependent on the presynaptic source of, of ARC RNA. So I think that's the best evidence so far. Uh, and there's really nothing, sim nothing similar has been done yet um, in mammalian neurons. Uh, yeah, so the, uh, the very elegant work from Jason Shepard was in, in cultures, right? So this is very important, but that doesn't show neuron to neuron communication. That needs to be shown in an intact circuit, whether it's an embryo or, an, or the mammalian brain. It hasn't been done yet. Um, so in terms of the level of expression, uh, yeah, I think one, one possibility is that the capsid uh, has, uh, we, as we were discussing, a more sort, of, more sort of homeostatic role in clearing away potentially excess RNA, right? So if you have really important partner protein partnerships that are, are finely tuned and dependent on the amount of the ARC protein that's available um, and will be competing out other partners, then it would be important to, to avoid um, aberrant sort of ectopic expression of the ARC protein. Yeah, so perhaps uh, they, they, play such a, they could have such a role. Thank you.